The brain is central to our existence. It generates everything we feel and do. It processes information coming from the outside world, such as the smell of food, and from inside the body, such as sensations of hunger. Using all this information, the brain then makes an appropriate response, driving behaviors that help us survive. For example, getting something to eat. Deep within the brain is a set of structures called the limbic system. The limbic system lies below the cortex, or outer layer, of the brain. In evolutionary terms, the limbic system is quite old compared with the cortex. One limbic system structure, the hippocampus, helps us form memories and learn. The amygdala contributes to emotions. The striatum is crucial to forming habits, routines of behavior that we tend to do without thinking, and processing reward. The limbic system contains the brain's reward circuit or pathway. The reward circuit links together a number of brain structures that control and regulate our ability to feel pleasure. Feeling pleasure motivates us to repeat behaviors, such as eating and other actions that are critical to our existence. A reward, or something linked with a reward, activates cells in the ventral tegmental area, or VTA, in the midbrain. This sets off a chain reaction of activation in the reward circuit. The long projections of VTA cells go to an area called the ventral striatum, or VS. The activation of cells quickly reaches a key part of the VS called the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is often called the brain's pleasure center. When activated, each cell generates an electrical signal. That electrical signal causes the cell to release molecules of neurotransmitter, which act as chemical messengers. Those chemical messages are received by another cell. This is how cells communicate with each other in an activated neural circuit. The brain has many different neurotransmitters, which serve multiple functions. The small gap between the sending and receiving cells is called the synapse. The cell sending the message is presynaptic, the receiving cell postsynaptic. In the presynaptic cell, the electrical signal causes changes. Some packets or vesicles that store neurotransmitter, migrate to the cell membrane, merge with it, open up, and release neurotransmitter molecules into the synapse. In the reward pathway, dopamine neurons release the neurotransmitter dopamine. The released dopamine molecules drift across the synapse. They link up with proteins called dopamine receptors on the surface of the receiving cell. These receptors span the receiving cell's membrane, with part on the outside and part on the inside of the cell. When dopamine binds in the receptor's exterior part, like a key into a lock, it triggers a cascade of events inside the receiving cell. Other proteins attached to the interior part of the receptor carry the signal onward within the cell. When there is excess dopamine, and as these molecules drop off receptors, they are free in the synapse again. Some dopamine molecules re-enter the sending cell via a special protein called a dopamine transporter on the sending cell's membrane. Back inside the cell, these dopamine molecules are now available for re-release. In a healthy brain, there is always a moderate level of dopamine in the synaptic space even in the absence of rewarding stimuli. When a reward is encountered, such as food, the presynaptic cell releases a larger amount of dopamine in a sudden burst. Dopamine transporters will then quickly remove the excess, returning the amount of dopamine to the original level. Dopamine surges in response to natural rewards help the brain learn, adapt, and navigate a complex world. Normal cycling of dopamine release occurs in the VS, activating the entire striatum and limbic areas. Activation of the reward pathway has a far-reaching impact throughout the brain. 
From the VS, the reward pathway extends to the prefrontal cortex, or PFC. The PFC powers our ability to think, plan, solve problems, and make decisions. The reward system influences the limbic system and the areas of the cortex that process sensory and motor information. Reward system activation also influences the cerebellum in the back of the brain, which affects coordination of movement as well as attention. Normal activation of the reward system creates a physical imprint on the brain that links certain stimuli with rewards that satisfy biological needs, such as food, and make us want to fulfill those needs by seeking out those rewards. Once the brain associates a stimulus with a reward, just seeing the stimulus can trigger a surge of dopamine in the reward system. When someone first uses cocaine, the drug quickly enters the brain where it blocks the transporters on the presynaptic cell. Since dopamine cannot re-enter the presynaptic cell, it begins to accumulate in the synapse, where it can reach abnormally high levels and remain there much longer than usual. The postsynaptic cell becomes hyperactivated, which produces a feeling of euphoria. This creates an incredibly powerful association between cocaine and pleasure, making a person want to repeat the experience of taking the drug. When someone first uses methamphetamine, the drug quickly enters the brain. At low doses, meth blocks the re-entry of dopamine into the presynaptic cell, just like cocaine does. But unlike cocaine, higher doses of meth can increase the release of dopamine from the cell leading to much, much more dopamine in the synapse, where it becomes trapped because meth prevents the transporters from removing it. Because so much dopamine remains in the synapse for such long periods of time, the postsynaptic cell is activated to dangerously high levels, causing the user to experience powerful feelings of euphoria, making meth incredibly addictive. Using cocaine or meth has far-reaching consequences on the brain. Drugs alter how the reward center communicates with the rest of the brain, affecting emotions, movement, reasoning, and decision-making. The repeated, frequent use of these drugs can change the actual wiring throughout the brain. These changes will eventually prevent a chronic user from feeling the same euphoria they experienced when first using the drug. Instead, they need to take the drug just to feel normal, and they feel compelled to take it, no matter the consequences. This is when chronic drug use becomes an addiction.